So the congregation knows that I'm a big New York football Giants fan, and I have a confession to make being a, a Giants fan that I took great delight last weekend in watching two other teams that I won't mention uh, lose in a very bad fashion. So we call that a great German word, schadenfreude, which is, which is a word that means taking delight in the misfortune of others. So I make that confession, and sadly, that's not joy, because I, could, uh, w I woke up the next morning, and I, I remember that my team is also very terrible. <laughs> so anyway, we're in the third week of a series for the new year, and I began talking about the concept of Happy New Year. We're all on a happiness quest. Whatever we want out of this new year, 2024, we hope that we experience happiness. And when somebody says, I just want to be happy, that can refer to a whole range of thoughts and emotions and experiences. I basically said there are three levels of well-being or goodness that we human beings can experience. The first is in our bodies and with our senses. We call this pleasure. When we have a pleasurable sensation, we we, uh, we feel good. And then the next level of well-being is more in our mind, in our thoughts. Well, these are experience of, experiences such as excitement or gratitude or just contentment. And more than a feeling, it's a pleasant thought, a happy thought. And so God created us to experience pleasure and pleasant thoughts. They are good when we experience them in appropriate ways that glorify God. It's just that they're neither the goal nor the destination. You experience pleasure. It passes. That experience ends. You experience a, a happy thought. That experience passes and it ends. They're both dependent on our circumstances around us, and they're both temporary. Well, there's an experience we can have at the deepest part of our being. What is the deepest part of our being that makes you, you? It's your soul. And at the level of our soul, the well-being or goodness we experience there we call joy. Joy is not dependent on the circumstances around us. It's independent of those things. And joy is not temporary. Joy can be long-lasting, even permanent. And there's another big difference I've said between joy and pleasure or thoughts of happiness. Those other things we can go at great lengths to seek out and acquire for ourselves. Many people spend a lot of their time and their money seeking happiness and pleasure. And the world wants to sell us on those things. Well, joy is not something we can buy. It's not something we can make for ourselves or manufacture. Joy is not something primarily we get from another person. Joy is a gift from God. And wherever there is joy in our soul, it's a sign, a sure sign, of the presence and power of God. So that's why Scripture describes joy like this. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. Joy is the fruit of the Holy Spirit within us. And as such, it will absolutely change and transform our life, at least gradually. Over time, joy will affect everything in our life, including our relationships. And on the one hand, grumpy Christians and grumpy, joyless congregations are one of the greatest testimonies against God and church, especially uh, for unchurched people and their own experience. And on the other hand, as disciples of Christ, as lifelong learners or followers of Christ, when we seek out joy and find it, it's the most compelling case to share our faith with others. Joy is attractive. It's not optional for a follower of Christ. And so for us, as I've said, it's all about positioning ourselves to receive it, to be on the lookout for it, to be on a joy quest to receive and to respond more deeply as people of joy. And last week I said the first step is to make a declaration. 
that Jesus Christ is the source of joy. If you're on the fence about being truly a follower of Christ, a disciple, a lifelong student of Him, a follower, I challenge you to just put a stake in the ground and say, Jesus, declare it. Jesus, you are the source of joy. Help me to believe more deeply. Now, let's be honest. You could say to me, Father, you don't know my circumstances. You don't know what I'm struggling with. This past week, you drove through a snowstorm a couple times to get to work. Or you were stuck at home, cabin fever. The kids were off from school several days, and it was driving you crazy. The older you get, the more you hate the snow and the cold or the winter. And maybe it's just you're getting over a cold or the flu, and it's taken like a month since Christmas, and you're just sick of all of it. How can we experience joy in our daily life? I want to just look at two words from the gospel that can help us to go deeper in our daily life to experience joy. And to get those two words, we'll look at our gospel reading today from Mark. On Mark's gospel, chapter 1, we're at the very beginning here of Jesus' public ministry as an adult. In fact, these are Jesus' very first words that he speaks. And so they're very important. Mark tells us this. After John had been arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. This is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. And so here at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, we've heard the last few weeks about John the Baptist. John was a colossal figure in the coming on the scene of Jesus. And so John's arrest by the authorities was a cue. It was a sign for Jesus. Now it's time for him to step up. Now it's time for him to get to work, to begin the mission and the ministry that our Heavenly Father called him to. What are his first words and his preaching and his teaching? This is the time of fulfillment. There's an urgency there. This is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's come. It's coming into this world here and now with my arrival on the scene. It's interesting that Jesus mentions in, in the Gospels the kingdom hundreds and hundreds of times. He talks about it all the time. But never once does he define what is the kingdom. He doesn't define what is the kingdom. Instead, he demonstrates it by his action, by his healing, by his miracle working, demonstrating his authority and the power that God gave him through his liberation of demons, all that he does, he demonstrates the presence and power of God. That's what the kingdom is. It's not just a place primarily. It's God's presence and power. And it hasn't ended. Jesus inaugurated it 2,000 years ago, but the presence and power of the kingdom is here in the movement that we're part of, you and I. The movement we call the church. The kingdom has come. This is the time of fulfillment. And so, what is our role to play? How do we participate in that breaking of the kingdom of God into this world? Jesus then says, next, repent. Well, we hear that word, repent, and it might feel negative to you. It may have a negative connotation. You know, doom and gloom preaching. You may think of some fire and brimstone preacher. Repent! Change your ways, you sinner. You're going to hell. And it may be the kind of reaction that turns people off from church, from some people. That's exactly what I expect people to say. It's all about you're going to hell. It's negative, filling me with guilt and fear. But actually, it's a positive thing. Well, let me explain. The word repent is a translation of the Greek word, which is metanoia. And another, even better way to translate that is change your mind. Change your mind. Change your thinking. Jesus is inviting and exhorting us to change our thinking. About what? He then says, repent and believe. In the gospel. Believe in the gospel. 
which is another Greek word, evangelion, simply means good news. So Jesus' basic message for those two words, repent and believe. And we could express it in a more colloquial way, in this way, change your mind about the good news. Change your mind from whatever else you're thinking about. The good news. Jesus then unpacks that all through his teaching and preaching and ministry. The good news that God revealed in Christ is our Heavenly Father and loves you. The good news that he sent his Son to die for you. Good news that he has anointed us with the Holy Spirit. The spirit of baptism within us marked on our soul to guide us in our life on our path and to call us to continue to be converted and to obedience to him. The good news that light has overcome the darkness. Good news that life has conquered death definitively. The good news that ultimately goodness and justice will prevail over evil in this world. The good news that even in all your difficulties and struggles in life, it's possible for you to experience joy. So isn't that good news to change your mind about? If you don't agree with that, to change your mind to believe that's good news news to believe in. Oh, here's the challenge. Repent and believe. Belief begins in our mind. Belief is a, a commitment to a truth, but it doesn't stand, stand there. It doesn't stay there. These two words are intertwined. Repent and believe. Belief that's authentic that will eventually, eventually lead to a change of behavior. Over time, authentic faith and belief in the good news, we will become more obedient to the entire gospel, to Christ's teaching, and put ourselves under His authority. A change of belief that leads to a change of behavior and ultimately a change of heart. That is joy. That is joy right there. So just be honest with yourself. Today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in Him. The urgency of the kingdom coming into this world. Today is the appointed time. Are you, honestly, be honest with yourself, experiencing joy today? And I have to confess, I have to repent myself that I have spent a big chunk of my life not in that place of joy, but instead stinking thinking. Stinking thinking of selfishness or pride or anger or self-serving or frustration or worry or fear or anxiety, you name it. I have to repent and believe. And I bet that many of you are in the same place I am. Repent and believe that there is something better. The good news of Jesus and the joy of the Holy Spirit we can experience. Here's my challenge for you this week. Where do you have to repent and believe in? Just reflect on that question in your prayer this week. Maybe it's the belief that you have to control everything or the belief that you're always right. Or maybe it's an attitude that leads to a behavior of selfishness or pride or envy or any other thing. Maybe it's the lie. The lie that you don't deserve the joy of the Lord for some reason. Because you don't think you're worthy of it. Or you don't think your circumstances allow it. Repent and believe. Believe in that good news. Change your mind. And just remember, joy is not something we have to make up or manufacture for ourselves. We can't do that anyway. It's about positioning ourselves to receive. To look in, the, in our mind and heart and behavior though, of anything that can be an obstacle in our, in our path and our ability to receive it. That's our job. And so may you just begin that 
in those two words this week in your prayer. Bottom line, my friends, the world, we know, offers us countless pleasures, doesn't it? And the world can even offer us at times genuine happiness, but never can the world offer us a single moment of joy. Only God can do that. And on the other hand, when we have it, neither can the world take it away. Amen.